Hey guys, how's it going? We got another Parables of the Bible video. And this time we are going to do the Parable of the Unjust Steward. And this is in Luke 16. And it goes from verse 1 to verse 12. Um, and this is another pretty interesting one. This is one not a lot of people discuss. This is one that um, a lot of people kind of shy away from because it kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And this actually touches on what I talked about in morning prayer. Um, and I didn't realize it until just before I started this video. And this actually kind of touches on that same subject about, about having connections in the world. Being relatable to other people because it just might save you. Um, it's pretty interesting what this alludes to. So I want to read through it, and then we'll go back and we'll discuss a few things on it. So Luke 16, the parable of the unjust steward. He also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. And when we go back and talk about this, you guys are going to see some really interesting things here. For you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Well, who's they? Let's find out. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. So the master commended the unjust steward. Now listen to this. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to the, your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? There's a lot to unpack here, uh, but let's go through some of the some of the things and some of the referencing that is in here. So right off the bat, you know there was a certain rich man. That's God. Boom. That's 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 the Lord. Um, so as we go through and you see the different links here and the different references here, it's going to start to explain what this is talking about. There was a certain rich man, the Lord, who had a steward. That's one of us. That's feeding the sheep, preaching the word, you know, dealing with the things that belong to him. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he was dealing unjustly with everyone. So the master called him and said, what is this? I hear, give an account of your stewardship. Think about what that's it, that says, give an account. Doesn't uh, Peter say we're all going to give an account, stand before the Lord and give an account? This is a... a, a a, a shadow of that for you can no longer be steward so he's taking that away this is very interesting because to me this this is this smacks of or hints of um bema seat and the account that we give to the father uh, whenever we end up in heaven then the steward said within himself what shall i do for my master is taking the stewardship away from me i cannot dig i am ashamed to beg i have resolved what to do that when i am put out of the stewardship they may receive me into their houses. Well, who was the they? Well, that's the people who owed something. That's the people who had an outstanding bill. So he called, he talked to them, and he knocked their bills down a little bit. He, he, he made a better deal for the people that owed the master money. And, and drew them in closer, created a better situation. It took away from what they owed the master, but it was a smart move on his part 
Because not only did he draw them closer to the master, greater deals could be made after this, but he also secured for himself a place where he could be taken care of. So he would have a, a place to be able to live and work and whatever. So he tells him what to do. Then you get down to verse 8 and he says, So the master, so the Lord commended, he commended the unjust steward. Why would he commend the unjust steward? Because he had dealt shrewdly. Well, what did he do? Well, he was out there, he was working deals in the world. He was making a way. He was creating a situation that would draw those people closer to the master. Kind of like what Paul did took that open door and created a better situation. Did something to make it sound or make it more presentable, the word, in order to bring more people in. Because whatever you tell somebody, that the words don't save them. The Lord saves them. So how you get them in there is, is totally different than what the Lord does with them after they're saved. Because what he does with them after they're saved is a totally different thing. You know, and this goes back to people attributed uh, so many people getting saved to Billy Graham. The thing is, there was one time they were talking about, oh, 100,000 people got saved today, this Billy Graham thing. Okay, well, that's great that 100,000 people were there, but 100,000 people didn't get saved. There were just as many people, actually more people probably didn't get saved than did get saved. See, it's something that happens internally. So this guy, this unjust steward, he's in there working on getting more people to the master. Hey, I'm going to lower your bill, pay your bill. I'm going to make you a better way for you. And he's working this deal out. Watch what he says here, though, because in verse 8, the master commends him for doing that, for dealing shrewdly. Why did he do that whenever he actually outed him some of what he owed? Go back and read what Moses did. When he came, when he, he stood in the gap for the people. What Jeremiah did, what Elijah did, what all the people did, John the Baptist, all the apostles, they worked the same way. The rest of verse 8 says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. They have more going for them than we do. Now, what does this refer to? Well, you can say this and refer to a Christian who deals unjustly, but goes and does something better to make a better way, works out, he works the bigger, better deal. This can also, you can say this can apply to, um, on judgment day, it'll be better for this guy because of what he did. Him being, say he's not really safe, say he's an unbeliever, claiming to be a believer, but he worked out a better deal because he saw what was happening. It may go better for him. Let's just go a little further then. And I say to you, so he's saying in verse 9, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Notice he says that when you fail. So what he's saying is don't avoid everybody that's unsaved. Don't cross everybody off. Keep a connection. Work the deal. You failing and having these friends to receive you, it could actually turn into something good. Like what this guy did here. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. That sounds like a, ne a double negative, doesn't it? It sounds like they go against each other. All you need is the faith of a mustard seed. That's faith in what is least. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much now he's starting to you're starting to get an idea he's referencing two different groups of people here therefore if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon who will commit to your trust the true riches so if you're not faithful in your dealings before you're saved or if you're not faithful even after you're saved how can you be trusted with anything else? How can you be trusted with the heavenly riches? Remember, we're supposed to be kings and priests. He's going to give us the kingdom. Well, how can we be trusted in that if we can't deal properly and faithfully now? And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? That sounds like Bema seat to me. 
So when I read these 12 verses, it, to me, it's talking about the saved and the unsaved. It's talking about the people of the world and the people of heaven. That you have people working in different aspects of life, doing different things, working different deals, uh, making a way, using those doors, taking those opportunities to get themselves in a situation to be able to work through it. Paul was very shrewd in how he did things. That gave him a lot more access to a lot more audiences and enabled him to get the gospel out to a lot more people. This one is very interesting. Now, when you go down here a little further below that, you see him elaborate. No servant, in verse 13, can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Well, then why did just a few verses up he say, make friends with the unrighteous mammon? He didn't say serve them. He said make friends with them. Don't turn away from the unsaved just because you're saved. Now, there's certain things you can't partake of, but you still need to have a connection with them. We still live in this world because that way if something happens, you've got something to fall on. Otherwise, you're just going to fall on your back. So verse 13 technically actually goes with this. Now when we get down here and see what else he's talking about, starting in verse 14, look at the first verse. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. So you see what, what, what he was getting at here is these were the chosen, the Pharisees, the stewards. They didn't deal correctly. They have, they have accusations coming against them. And then look what he's done. And But now look what he what the master said. Master says in verse 8, he commend, he's going to commend him. You're an unjust steward, but I commend you because of the way you dealt. You dealt in a way that made a better situation for you. Now, again, you go back to the freedom we know about that we have in Christ. Not a freedom to do what we want to satisfy ourselves. Freedom to do the things to satisfy the Lord. The commendation coming from the Master actually... Well, no, that's not what I was trying to get at. The, the, the commendation was for him being smart enough to know the right thing to do instead of just giving up. What do most people do when they find out they were wrong about something? They give up. The smart people, the shrewd people, do something different. They change the situation to make it out to be a benefit. Was it still a benefit for the master? Yeah, he got his bills paid. He didn't get everything he was owed, but he got his bills paid. That shrewd or that unjust steward made a way for himself whenever he got kicked out. Now, was it the right thing to do? Um, probably not. But he still got that commendation for, for dealing shrewdly, for knowing what to do, for taking care of business. And in a way, he made a, a better deal for everybody. And it worked out good. So not everything that people do, we look at it and we go, mm, I don't know, so that, that seems like it's kind of wrong. Not everything that people do is actually that much of a negative. It actually is just shrewdly dealing properly with the world. Because we can deal with the world and still be godly. The problem happens down here with verse 13. When you serve the mammon, when you serve the world, you can work in the world you can deal in the world, but you don't have to serve the world. And that's shrewd, shrewdly dealing. That's understanding the freedom that you have to be able to do those things. What does it do? It opens more doors for you. Because he, tell, he literally tells him in verse 9, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves. Make friends for yourselves. By unrighteous mammon. That when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. That's very interesting, an everlasting home. 
the wording of this is very interesting. A lot of people have different comment commentaries on this. I'm just showing you guys what it what it seems like it's talking about to me. It actually it seems like there's several different things being discussed here. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So now he gives a, an admonition. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, if you can't be, he wants you to be faithful in the things, your dealings in the world. If you can't be faithful in your dealings in the world, how do you expect to get the things that come from the Lord? Another admonition contained within this is deal justly, deal righteously with everyone, the saved and the unsaved. Do the right thing all the time. Think about what you're doing. Think about the right thing to do. Think about where and when you need to take your stand. Verse 12, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Well, what is another man's? Well, everything here is the Lord's. Everything we do for each other, for our brethren, taking care of them, that's all the Lord's. If we can't be faithful in that, how do we expect to get what is supposed to be ours from him when we get up there? So, to me, there's a lot of different things going on here. It's, it's To me, this is talking about dealing with the world. To me, this is talking about dealing with friends and family who aren't saved. To me, this is talking about um, when you're dealing with religion and you're dealing with churches and you're dealing with, um, cause if you have a, if you have a church that's growing, you make a lot of money and you need to have a good team of people that are loyal and trustworthy to be able to deal shrewdly for it to work out. And not a lot of people do that. Some do, but not a lot. And to me, he's also talking about how we deal with each other, the re the other brethren. Because there's a lot of people that ha are in different levels of development. To me, there's a whole lot of different aspects, that uh, uh, facets to this parable. And it talks a, of, of a lot of different things. And how he looks at us to see how we deal with things. Do we deal righteously with people? Are we dealing properly with people? Are we serving and working and dealing justly with the people we have to interact with. You got to work. You can't work for Christians in every instance. And are we dealing with each other justly? Are we being shrewd in business? Are we using our heads? Are we taking care of those around us? Because even though we want to dedicate our time to the brethren, we still take care of the people who are unsaved. We're called to go and go out to them. So you guys have probably heard more on this uh, of other people's commentaries. This is just my take on this. Because it sounds to me like the unjust steward came out pretty decent on that. Even though he got his stewardship taken away, he still came out pretty decent. He's still going to have a, have a place and have a way by doing what he did. And ultimately, to me, that's leading back onto the judgment. When we go to judgment, it's going to be more favorable for people like that. But in verse 13, he brings it to a close. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So in this admonition here in verse 13 for this whole parable, he's saying, listen, you can't be attached to one and the other. Like the, like the, the uh, unjust steward. The unjust steward served his master and he served money. But because of him dealing properly or dealing in a, in a good way with the people that owed his master money, he got a combination for it. us being part of God's family. We can't serve this world and serve him. We serve him. If we serve him, what do we do? We deal justly with everyone. It's real easy to fall into that trap to deal unjustly with other people. I know because it's happened to me. And it's a fight. 
to go to ask yourself, what's the right thing to do here? And when you figure out what the right thing is, turn away from the wrong thing. Be faithful in a little, and you will be faithful in much. Verse 10. Now that same person decides to be un unjust in a little, he'll be unjust as much. This also goes back to, you break one aspect of the law, you've broken the whole law. So, like I said, there's a lot, there's actually a lot more than that in here to unpack. There's a, uh, there's a lot more going on in this. And it's important to actually go down and read below. Because he talks a little bit more about that down here. But the big focus would be verse 14. Talking about these things. Because they heard that stuff. And they, they were lovers of money. And they didn't like what he had to say. So I wanted to share that one with you. This is one of the ones that I hadn't gotten to because this one was kind of complicated to describe. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot that this can refer to. There's a lot that this can, this can be uh, attached to. But it's pretty interesting. Um, and these parables, like this one here, mainly was aimed at the Pharisees. Well, we can learn some stuff from it too. How do we deal in our everyday lives with the people around us, saved or unsaved? Do we avoid the unsaved and thereby not take advantage of those open doors? Or do we get involved in certain things that put us in the path of those people so that we can take advantage of those open doors? This is why it's good to study Paul's writings because Paul understood where, how his freedom worked. We have that same freedom. But you got to know where your heart is in it. You got to know what your driving force is behind it. And you got to know how you're going to work it to be a benefit to the Lord. How it's going to glorify Him. Because that's the ultimate goal. And what was amazing was this guy, this unjust steward, ended up glorifying his master. Because he marked those bills down. Well, they had the other guys do it and mark their bills down. They drew closer to the master because they, in their mind, they probably understood that it came from him. So they thought he was a good guy to deal with. So they, he actually created more business for his master by doing what he did. A lot to think about, a lot to consider. And we take that and apply it to our everyday life. And we realize, you know, different things that, we may have to change how we do or different things that we may have to make decisions on we might be able to make a different decision and the outcome actually end up being better so it's worth taking the time to sit down and read through this and think about it especially going into prayer about it but if you get a chance um, go and look up other people's interpretations of this and see what you think and if you guys have something that stands out to you in here please share it in the comments I'd love to read where, what you guys get out of this because, you know, I get probably four or five different things out of this. Um, different, different examples. And what this can be referring to and what it can talk about. All right. That's the parable of the unjust steward. We're going to try to do one of these every day till we finish this playlist. I still got a bunch more to do. And we'll see where it takes us. Because there's still a lot of good ground to cover. And I have something else to share later uh, that you guys might find very interesting. Uh, but I'll share it for evening prayer. Evening prayer might be a little bit longer tonight. I'm going to have the prayer first, and then we're going to look at some scripture and some screenshots uh, afterwards. So that way, if you just came for the prayer, you can do the prayer and go. Uh, but if you want to see the other stuff, we can go and look at the other stuff. And uh, pretty interesting. Pretty, pretty cool what the Bible says. And what do we see the example of it in the world? And it shows us something. It tells us something about Jesus and about what was going on and about a location of a very particular site that a lot of people have been trying to find and haven't fully, I think, figured out where it is. But most people have a pretty good guess and a pretty good idea. But the little bit of stuff I looked at, and I'll show you some screen, some aerial shots of that area. 
can show you the proof of it. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I will see you guys in the next video.